Uh, I've been an investor in index funds for almost 40 years. I will tell you how I happened to become one. I was had working on my Washington Post column at the time, and I got a phone call from a guy who says, my name is Jack Bogle. I'd like to come and see you. And uh, I said, about what? And he gave me the index fund wrap and how it does better than managed funds. And I said, well, I was very skeptical. And I said, well, send me what you have to say. I read it. I, I still thought there was obviously, it had to be hindsight. It had to be picking numbers from the past. So anyway, I had lunch with Jack. And all I remember about that lunch is that there were tables spread all over the table. There were all kinds of pieces of paper with numbers on them and whatnot. And so I listened, and I went back, and I thought about it some more. And I um, called him back, and I said, you know, I think you're right. And he made a convert of me at that time prior to uh, having... Uh, individual retail index funds available. The only way you could invest was either with individual stocks or with managed mutual funds. And so, I mean, that was how we all got started. That was what we did. But all of a sudden, there was this revolution, and I am delighted that Jack came to me with his numbers. I am also an index investor for bonds, by the way, specifically government bond funds, which will probably surprise you because they are paying zilch. Um, individual investors usually ignore these funds. Instead, you buy high yield bond funds, also known as junk bond funds, for their higher interest income. But you know, of course, that these funds invest in the bonds of low quality companies, which leads to two problems. First, when business turns bad, some of the bonds in these funds default. They don't pay. Or they will be downgraded and lose some of their value. Studies have shown that the losses from defaulted and downgraded junk bonds exceeds the extra interest you earn from the high yields over time. So the average investor in high yield funds is not actually receiving the yield that he or she expected when you invested. And that is a surprise to many people. And second, when the stock market falls, the price of a high yield bond fund falls too, as has been happening now. For a really bad example, in 2008, uh, when the S&P fell 37%, the, the junk junk bonds that pay the highest yield fell 50 to 60%. So those bonds were hurting you rather than helping you. By contrast, government bond funds rise in price when stocks have a sharp decline. We've seen that over the past month. Uh, we saw it hugely in 2007, 2008. So owning government funds gives you protection when stocks go really bad. And surprisingly, again, given what I've just told you about the uh, high yield bond funds, government funds do as well or better than junk funds over the long run while taking fewer risks along the way. I've seen a lot of research there, and I have to say it surprised me, as I'm sure it surprises you. Now, what we worry about most, of course, is whether our savings are going to last as long as we do. How much can you take out of a nest egg every year without running out of money in older age? And a tremendous amount of research has been done on this subject, too, uh, especially over the past 10 years because of the retirement of the boomer generation. 10,000 people a day are reaching 65, and a lot of people are worrying about them. I talked to all the key players who are involved in this kind of research for the book. The classic safe number, as I'm sure you all have heard, is 4%. Take 4% of the value of your financial savings, stocks, bonds, CDs, whatever, financial savings, not real estate, financial. And in the first year, you draw the money out. And in each subsequent year, you take the, the same dollars plus an increase for inflation, if there is any. Your money will last 30 years, and in almost all cases, it will last much longer. Uh, the 4% rule would have carried you through the Great Depression. It would have carried you through the great stagflation of the late 60s and 1970s, which was actually the worst time for retired people. 
It has only been 16 years since the tech stock crash of 2000, but so far the 4% rule is working fine. Now, if your investments are well diversified, meaning that you own smaller stock funds as well as large stock funds, for example, in a total market index fund, you can safely start with a 4.5% withdrawal plus inflation increases every year. And again, this strategy would have worked during the worst 30-year periods in our history. But that is pretty conservative. And I ask, is it really worth it to create a financial plan uh, that will aim solely at getting you through a period, a 30-year period that includes a depression or a hyperinflation? 98% uh, of the time, 30-year uh, periods are much better than that. So do you prepare for just the two worst, or do you prepare for the better ones? And if you are flexible in your spending, meaning that you can reduce your withdrawals, if stocks go badly for two or three years, you can start with 5.5%. And in fact, a bit more. I see a hand raised, but I'm almost finished. Let's do it with the Q&A. <laughs> Uh, in other words, there are recipes. You can look at the options, consider your circumstances, and make a well-informed choice. One important point for these withdrawal choices to succeed, you have to have at least some of your retirement money in stock-owning mutual funds. You can't say, I'm scared and I'm doing only bonds and CDs. Uh, the minimum to make any of these withdrawal plans work is uh, about 35% of your total financial nest egg in stocks and the rest in bonds. And the maximum is about 70% in stocks with the rest in bonds. And regard, regarding asset allocation, all the research, again, assumes that you keep your allocation between spot, stocks and bonds at a steady state for life. For example, if you start out 50-50 stocks and bonds, you keep it there, you don't uh, reduce your stocks and increase your bonds as you get older. If you do that, if you reduce your stocks, your total return is going to drop. Uh, a surprising new approach being proposed by financial planners is that uh, you reduce your stock holdings somewhat as retirement approaches because that is your day of maximum risk if the market crashes the day you retire. And then you actually increase your stock allocation during your early retirement years. And I've looked at a lot of the data on that and I thought it was pretty interesting and actually I switched to it. You know, so I'm your guinea pig. Oh, so far I'm fine, we'll see. I should reiterate, by the way, that all this research was done using the broadest stock and bond market indexes. It obviously can't be done on portfolios of individual stocks because you don't know how they're going to turn out. Uh, it also means conceptually, not that you would do it, but you might, conceptually it means that you could make your money last for at least 30 years by owning just two mutual funds. Uh, total market U.S. stock fund and a total market U.S. bond fund. I mean, that's a surprising solution. You probably don't want to do that. You can add other types of investments if you want to, but the point is you don't, don't have to. Other investments are essentially decoration. A very quick word about long-term care insurance, should you own it or not. It is expensive, as you know, and most companies keep raising their premiums on existing shareholders, sometimes by 30 or 40 percent. If you're single, I don't see the point of having a long-term care policy. If you enter a nursing home, uh, you will use your own savings and investments to pay your bills. And if you run out of money, uh, Medicaid steps in. I have some experience with that because that's what happened with my mother-in-law, my late mother-in-law. But if you're married and need care, you have to consider what would happen to the well spouse at home. And here I'll tell you another personal story. Uh, my late husband was quite a bit older than I, was, I am. And when long-term care policies first started coming out, they were terrible policies. You just couldn't count on them to pay for anything. It was crazy. So we didn't get one. And then they got better. And at that point, his health was poor. And so he 
we couldn't get a long-term care policy for him. And then he had a really bad couple of last years, and I was able to take care of him at home happily. Cost $100,000 a year, and it would have cost about the same if he had been in a nursing home. So uh, then, fast forward a little bit, and I started dating Carl, and he thought maybe we should get married. And I said, do you have long-term care insurance? <laughs> And he didn't. And I said, that's a deal breaker. Been there, done that. <laughs> so fortunately, he qualified for long-term care insurance. So now we both have it and we got married. <laughs> so if you are still working and can get it at a group rate through a company, I think it's a very good deal. If you're buying individually, there are ways of reducing the cost, but of course you have to pass a health exam to get it, so uh, the older you are, the harder it is to get it. Uh, when comparing policies, find out how the companies have treated their existing policyholders. Have premium increases been low? Have they been high? High is not good. At the moment, I know of only three companies that have never raised premiums on existing long-term care policy holders, Mass Mutual, New York Life, and Northwestern Mutual. Uh, not to say that that won't happen in the future, but that's the current state of play. And finally, you have to plan not only a financial transition to retirement and to later retirement, but an emotional transition as well. And I think that's the really hard one. You're moving away from the high status of earner and into the role of engaged citizen retired. And such a sharp change takes some getting used to, as those of you who have gone through it know. A friend of mine recently told me it took him a year. We are being replaced by younger people whose world it is going to be. That's how it works. Uh, but still, we have 20 or 30 years to go. What are we going to do with them? A voluntary retirement usually starts out fine, I'm free, I'm free, but after a few months or weeks, you start saying free to do what? And it is very typical for a depression to set in for a while. There is only so much golf anyone can play, I think, or so many TV series you can binge watch. You have always known about the need to plan for retirement financially, but what comes as a surprise to many is the urgent need to plan for another life. And in a way, this is where we stood many years ago when we first got out of college and there was a bare field in front of us and we didn't know who we were going to become or what we were going to do. And then we figured it out and we invented ourselves piece by piece. And at retirement, you are facing another open field. Again, we have to invent this time reinvent a life that is productive and engaged. You need to step into retirement with at least something on your calendar, and you have something for a while, but as later retirement comes, you have to get something else on your calendar. The faster you can bury the old workplace you and discover the, the liberated you, the more satisfying retirement is going to be.